Welcome to this week's sermon from Spark. We are a community who believes we are deeply loved by God and seek to welcome, support, love, and serve every person we meet. We hope this message has something for you today. All right, we're gonna jump right into it. So I need you to reach under your chair and pull out your Bible. And we are going to continue in our series that we started a couple weeks ago. What is our series? Does anybody remember? Do you remember what we've been talking about the past two weeks? Anybody? It's on the screen now. We are Spark. But what about We Are Spark have we been talking about? Yeah, there we go. So we just did our community statement at the very beginning of service, right? And at the very end of our community statement, we say we are going to be people who are welcoming, supporting, loving, and serving every person we meet. So we've been talking about what each of those words mean. Like, what does it mean to be welcoming? What does it mean to be supportive? What does it mean to serve others? What does it mean to be loving? And we're going to use different stories and examples from Scripture. So, so far, which two words have we done? Do you remember? Welcoming Welcoming and... Supporting, right? Last week we talked about supporting. So today we're going to talk about what it means to serve and to be serving other people, all right? So in those Bibles, open them to the book of John, which is in the New Testament. It's the second half. John is a gospel story. It tells us the one of the stories of Jesus, one of the perspectives of the stories of Jesus. And we're going to be going to chapter 13. If you're not familiar with how to look things up in the Bible, 13 is going to be the big number you find on the screen, or on the screen, shoo, on the page. Spend too much time on computers, friends. And then verse is going to be the teeny tiny numbers of the sentences. And we're going to start at verse 1 so you don't have to look too far. Um, And so for those of you who are in the Red Pew Bibles, that's on page 822. Page 822. Chapter 13, chapter 13, book of John. Now, something you need to know, just like we talk about every time we open the Bible, we're opening kind of into a middle of a story, right? And if I were to pick a random novel, like, I don't know, if I just opened The Hunger Games and opened it to page 100 and started reading, it'd be kind of confusing, right? You don't know what's happened before then, and you don't know what's coming after that. Same things with the Bible, right? We just opened a chapter 13 of a book, so we need to know a couple things about what's going on, right? So Jesus has come into the city of Jerusalem, and he is preparing for the Passover. Does anyone know what a Passover is? It's a Jewish holiday or festival where they remember the story of how God passed over the Israelite people, meaning kept them safe during one of the plagues, right before they were led to freedom by Moses. Remember Moses where he lifted up his staff and the whole Red Sea parted and they got through? So they're remembering how God protected them, and they're celebrating this every year through a festival called Passover. So Jesus is with his disciples. They're getting ready to celebrate the Passover. It's a wonderful time where they all get together, and so there's a lot of customs involved with that, and one of those involves having a meal. So Jesus is preparing to have a meal with his disciples. We need to know that as we start. So it says, before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew that his time had come to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them fully. What did Jesus do? He loved them, right? Jesus and his disciples disciples were sharing the evening meal. And the devil had already provoked Judas, Simon Iscariot's son, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew the Father had given everything into his hands and that he had come from God and was returning to God. That's a fancy way of saying Jesus knew that he was the Son of God. He knew that God was with him and that had sent him into the world, all right? He had kind of figured that out over the course of his life. And so he got up from the table, took off his robes, picking up a towel and tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a wash basin and began to wash the disciples' feet. Everybody say, say what? So Jesus began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that he was wearing. When Jesus came to Simon Peter, Peter said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? And Jesus replied, you don't understand what I'm doing now, but you will understand later. No, Peter said, you'll never wash my feet. And Jesus replied, unless I wash you, you won't have a place with me. So Simon Peter said, then Lord, not only my feet, but my hands and my head. I love a Peter. 
Jesus responded, those who have bathed, Peter, they don't need no bath no more. They need only to wash their feet because they are completely clean. You disciples are clean, but not every one of you because he knew that there would be one who would betray him. And that's why he said, not every one of you is clean. And after he washed the disciples' feet, he put on his robes and returned to his place at the table. And he said to them, do you know what I have done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you speak correctly because I am. But if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you too must wash each other's feet. I have given you an example. Just as I have done, you also must do. So this is the word of God for us, the people of God. So we read in this story that Jesus does what? What's he do? Wash his disciples' feet. Anybody wanna sign up to wash a bunch of people's feet? No? Why, why wouldn't you wanna wash somebody's feet? You don't know what they've been walking in? So you, somebody might pay you good? Yeah, okay. If somebody, if somebody gave you money, you might wash their feet, right? So not many of us are willing to just like sign up to wash a bunch of people's feet, right? But Jesus does this. And why does Jesus do this? It tells us right at the very beginning. Nope. At the very beginning, it was like the second verse we read. I made you repeat it. Why did Jesus do this? Because he... Love them, right? Jesus knows that his time with his disciples is now limited, that his life is gonna be coming to an end soon. He's figured that out. And he knows that this might be one of the last things that he gets to do with his friends, is have this meal with them. And sometimes when I've read this passage, this is one of my favorite passages in the Bible, I've wondered that about myself. Like, if I had the opportunity to gather all my people and do one, and knew that it was the last time I'd probably see all of them together, what would I do? Would you have a meal? Would you go to Disney World? Would you go kayaking on a river and enjoy the peace? Would you, what would you do? Would you have your favorite meal? Would you go to your favorite place? Jesus chooses to wash their feet. Everybody say, say what? Say what? That's weird, right? for us to think about. Like, of all the things you get to pick, Jesus, you wanna look at people's dirty, linty toes, right? And you wanna wash their feet. And the disciples were weirded out by this too because the custom was they were at a table and the table would have been more like coffee table height. So you know how, maybe it's just me, but sometimes when you're watching a movie and you're sitting cross applesauce at your coffee table eating your pizza or eating your nachos or whatever, that's kind of the level of the table that they would have been eating at. And so all these disciples were kind of lounging around. And so it was customary to have your feet washed before you ate because if you're that low to the ground, you know, you're a lot closer to everybody's feet. And if you've been traveling for a long time before you get to your friend's house for dinner, they feet nasty, right? So they washed their feet before they had food. So they've been, they probably already had their feet washed, right? And they're eating this meal, or they're preparing for this meal, and Jesus gets up from the table and he wraps a towel around himself and he starts washing their feet. And they're like, Jesus, we don't, what? What are you doing? Because that was the role of a servant. You have people in your house that did that for you. And Jesus was the host of the meal. Jesus was one of the most important people at the table. And so for the most important person, to do the job of the person that they would have probably deemed less important was kind of weird, right? And that's why Peter's like, no, 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 Jesus, this is not right. If anything, I think Peter would have told him, I should be the one washing your feet, right? Like you're the important person at this table. It's not me, Jesus. But Jesus washes their feet. And we know that Jesus does this because he loves them. And so this teaches us first and foremost something really important about God. Because we all know that feet are stinky. We all have, get dirt on our toes. We all get that lint that gets stuck under your toenail. We all, some of us got bunions and blisters. Some of us, we, we don't have, that's not really, you know, the part of our body we're putting makeup on and being like, look, I'm very cute, right? Like, it's our feet, right? But God is willing to get into the messy, icky, stinky parts of us, of our lives, of who we are. That's what this story teaches us, is that Jesus doesn't look at disciples and be like, ooh, Judas. Bro, you got to cut those toenails. And like, oh, James. 
Can you get some clean socks, right? He doesn't judge what he finds. Also, it would have been a lot more normal for people to wash each other's sheets at the time, so it would have been quite such a weird thing. But we don't hear any words of condemnation from Jesus. We see Jesus doing something loving and caring for the people that he loves. It's kind of weird to think about, but about the only time that we kind of do this for other people where we make sure that their bodies are clean is when they're an itty-bitty baby and they can't do it for themselves, right? And a lot of times, and many of the adults in the room will know this, is when someone is nearing the end of their life, right? We might, at their bedside, use a washcloth and keep them clean. And so most often when people are helping us out, it's because we are helpless and unable to do for ourselves. And here, God meets us in that place. Here, Jesus washes the disciples' feet, even though they could have reached down and done it for themselves because this is the act of service that he's doing for them. And so we learn from the foot washing a lot about who God is that God is not afraid of our bunions and blisters, that God is willing to humble God's self and get down on God's knees before our feet and to wash them without condemnation or judgment, and that God is willing to tenderly and carefully dry our feet off and send us on our way. The other thing we learn from this story is that Jesus gives a command. So after he washes their feet, he gets up and he sits back down at his seat and he tells the disciples something. And it says that he commands it. Now, is a command a suggestion? No. No. Is a command, if you feel like it, not really. Command is an instruction, a direction, a this is what you need to do. And what he says is just as I have done, you must also do. Everybody repeat that with me. Just as I have done, done, you must also do. do. Again, just as I have done, done, you must also do. do. But I don't want to touch people's feet, Jesus. Right? Like, you know, sometimes we read the Bible and we take it super literally. Like, I mean, Jesus said, go do it. So that means we got to go wash everybody's feet, right? Obviously, there's a little bit more of a a, a metaphor going on here, right? Jesus is saying, just as I have humbled myself, just as I have done the unexpected, just as I have wrapped a towel around myself and made myself the least of these in the room, you must also be willing to do for others, right? So what does that look like? What does that mean? So we talk about in our community statement that we're people who serve others, And service sometimes gets like kind of made shallow of just like doing a random act of kindness. Like um, Justin and Tyler held the doors open for us when y'all were walking in. That's a lovely act of service. And I'm not trying to downplay that. But what Jesus is talking about here is a little bit more than that, right? There's a little bit more that he's giving and offering. Jesus is telling us that to serve other people, we have to be willing to set our own needs and wants and desires aside for a moment. Not forever but for a moment, right? That when we serve other people, it's not always convenient. It's not only when we kind of have time to do it or when we feel like it. That serving other people sometimes means getting your hands dirty, literally, figuratively, whatever. Doing the thing that other people don't want to do at the time. That serving other people sometimes costs us something the way that we do when we give our tithes and offerings, right? Of whether that's our finances or whether it costs us our time or our energy or something else. So when Jesus says, do what I have done, that's what he's getting at, is that service that kind of makes you put some skin in the game, that pushes you to do something that you might not otherwise do, that does some, to do something that's a little bit unexpected. And maybe you've experienced that before. Maybe you've had somebody serve you in a way that kind of made you uncomfortable. And I, I think about, for me, that often happens at times where I am in a lot of need, like maybe um, after a time where I've lost a loved one or if someone in my family is like recovering from an illness or something and I'm kind of stretched thin and I need other people to come in and help me 
And I'm not always the best at like being willing to accept the help because like I can do it all by myself, right? And sometimes when you accept the gifts and graces of other people, it can feel uncomfortable because it makes you feel like, well, well, maybe they think less of me because I can't do it by myself. But that's not true, right? Think about how much we sometimes enjoy giving gifts to other people and how that brings us joy. And we love seeing the expressions on their faces and it brings us a sense of fulfillment too. So serving people is something that can be kind of hard. Serving, being served by other people can be something that's hard to accept. That's what we see Peter doing when he's like, no, Jesus, don't touch my feet. It's okay, I got it, right? But also serving other people can be uncomfortable at times, right? You don't know how they're gonna react or how they're gonna respond, and sometimes it's, it's not convenient or nice for you. But the call and the command of Christ is that we do it, just as Jesus did. And here's the other little like asterisk, like if we put a little footnote, is who does Jesus call us to serve? We say it at the end of our community statement. Every person we meet. So here's the thing about serving. Not only can it be a little bit uncomfy, not only can it be a little inconvenient, it also means serving that person you really would rather not, right? Because who was at the table? Jesus. Who was at the table? It was Judas and Peter who denied him. So the people that betrayed him and denied him. Can you imagine a person in your life, and I know y'all got drama llama for your mama drama, who was like a backstabbing friend, who broke your trust, who went behind your back and told your secret that they didn't say anything, and told so-and-so who you liked, and da 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 That person is who you're supposed to serve. That is the offensiveness of the gospel. Sometimes the gospel offends us. And thank goodness, because if we all thought it was happy-go-lucky and rainbows and kumbaya, we probably would the world look a lot different. But Jesus' love can be offensive at times. And this part of this story is what's offensive, is that Jesus even washed the foot of the disciple that was going to turn around and betray him. And so for us, too, that means we don't get to decide who is worthy of our service and love. Oh, Jesus, that's not, that's not how we live oftentimes here on earth, right? Now, love little, another little asterisk but not note. That doesn't mean that we put up with abusive people who don't know how to maintain our, their boundaries with us, right? That's not a, a, a doormat opportunity for us to allow other people to harm us. However, what it does say is that little spitty spat drama that you got in the cottage is not worth it right? That we can still serve one another in these ways. And often think about what it does. Think about what that did for Judas. It didn't change what he did, right? He still went and betrayed Jesus after this. But I wonder what went on in Judas and Peter's minds after this, reflecting back on this night with Jesus. What did that communicate to them about how he felt about them? That no matter what, that knowing even though they were going to do what they were going to do, that Jesus still offered them that love. And so how would that change some of our relationships with people who are a little bit harder to love if we're willing to serve one another even though? I think we would look a lot more like heaven around here, right? If we were willing to put our pride aside for a minute and help someone in need whether or not we feel like they deserve it. And so we learn from this story that God is willing to get into our messy, icky toes and clean them up. And then we also learn that we are called to do the same thing and everybody can cringe a little bit inwardly at what that call says for us and how offensive that can be and how hard it can be. But we also can reflect on times where we have been served and where we have done some serving and know that when we do that, something happens right? That God's love is made real in the world. And that makes it worth it, right? And so that's our calling um, for this week. So that's what it means to serve others, is that we serve even if it's inconvenient, even if it makes it a little, a little bit icky, and even if it's that person that you think probably doesn't deserve it. 
Because the truth of the matter is, friends, that there are a lot of times where none of us have deserved it, and we have received the goodness and grace of God, right? So this morning, we're gonna have an opportunity to do this in real life. So, and like literally, not just like a figurative kind of way. We're gonna have the opportunity for foot washing. Now, if that just made you go, oh, no, 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 I'm gonna challenge you to lean in a little bit because you're just like Peter, right? No, 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 don't do that, Jesus. But I will tell you that many people who have leaned in and stepped out of their comfort zone and tried something new have often found God there in that place. So what we're gonna do in just a minute, uh, Tyler, can we have one of the chairs you're sitting on, please, sir? Um, Is that, now, here's cardinal rule number one. Did Jesus talk about people's feet while he was washing them? No, so we ain't gonna talk about other people's feet today, all right? So what's gonna happen? Are you ready? Are you done? All right, so again, nobody's forced to do anything. This is an open invitation to anybody who's willing and would like to. Mr. Blake and I will be doing the foot washing just to make that level of comfort less uncomfortable um, for y'all. So what you'll do, what you'll do is when you're ready, I'll wait. What we're going to do is at your chair, if you would, please remove your shoes and or socks if you have them on before you come up. Then you can come forward to one of our two chairs, and Mr. Blake or I will wash your feet. If you are a female who is wearing a skirt, if you could please come to my station, that would be great. And I will have a towel that we can put over your lap. And then, um, shh, why are you there? Oh, oh, that's not. Please. All right, so you'll come up, have your shoes already removed. If you, we will wash your feet, we'll say a blessing over you. Then you can return to your seat and you can put your shoes back on, okay? We are going to um, have music playing during this. I'm just gonna say right now, this is worship, okay? So the giggling and the talking, there's some of that that's okay, right? Like when you put water in it, it's okay, it's a little squirmy, that's fine. But we don't need it to turn into something that's not respectful, all right? Does everybody understand? This is meant to be a moment of worship. I want you to spend a moment reflecting on what it would be like to have Jesus washing your feet. What does that mean for you, right? So we're gonna pray, and then Miss Betty will put play on the Spotify list, and then we will have our foot washing. And we will be here as long as it takes for everybody who wants a turn to have a turn, and then we will be done. What did I say about respectful? Thank you. All right, let's pray. God, I know and we know that it can be uncomfortable to have you come and see the parts of us that are not as clean, that are not as polished, that are not as presentable in the way we would like you to see us. And so God, as we come before you this morning and as we show you our stinky feet, God, we give thanks that you are our God who sees us without judgment who loves us without condemnation, and who meets us exactly where we are. And so God, I pray over this time that we're about to share that we would be able to experience you in this moment, that your spirit would pour out over all of us here, that we would feel your love in this place. And that any of the giggles and uncomfortableness that we might feel, God, that you would use that to show us something about who you are and your love for us. And God, I pray that this experience would do something, stir something in our hearts to receive this love from you. So that as we leave this place today and as we go throughout all of our days, God, that we would be mindful of all that we would receive and so that we can do just as you commanded us to do and do likewise in the world, that we can share your love with strength and confidence and without reservation, God. 
So be with us during this time. Help us to experience your love here and now. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let us pray. God, we give you thanks for your love. And God, I pray that this discomfort that we might have experienced today would be transformed into a sense of peace, into a sense of knowing, to a sense of understanding that your love is willing to humble itself before us and dig into the mess of our lives, that your love does not hide from what is stinky and unclean, that your love meets us where we are, and that your love cleanses us and makes us new and fills us up so that as we go from this place and as we go about our days and our lives, God, that your love would come from us in a way that we can't even explain, that would pour out from us into the lives of other people, and that it would be a love that is not rooted in our own desires and wants and likes and dislikes, God, but that it would be a love that is rooted firmly in you. God, by your spirit, pour out your love on us. In the name of Jesus, we pray, amen. Thank you for joining us. If you'd like to learn more about our ministry, follow the link in the description below. Peace be with you. And also you.